Hi, I'm Harold Holzer, and I'm the author of Monument Man, The Life and Art of Daniel Chester French. And this is A House Divided. Good afternoon, I'm Daniel Weinberg, and you're watching A House Divided. Okay. And if you're uh, watching this later on YouTube, uh, you can still probably order books. If you're looking right now and would like to have a book signed for you, please feel free to use the button just below the screen and press that and order your book. And we'll have our author, Harold Holzer, uh, get a book and we'll send it out to you. So. Here we are today, and this is many, many times. I mean, you know, when I was thinking of this and having you here, Harold, I was thinking there are numbers of authors that come in, but very few really don't need an introduction. You know, the president, by that I mean Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> uh, you know, maybe George Clooney. And our, our author today. Did you have Clooney? Uh, not yet. If you oh, can I get see. him, let me know. All right. But I mean, he needs to write a book first. So. George, George, here we go. Harold was, was formerly the senior vice president for public affairs at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. He's currently director of the Roosevelt House Public Policy Institute at Hunter College. I think you need to have just one little thing to say instead of these long lines. He's a winner of numerous prizes for writing and co-editing, about 50-ish books, am I right? Uh, past chair of the Lincoln Centennial Commission, Centennial. Bicentennial. You're right. Oh my gosh. You're not that old. Uh, I feel it. And he appears everywhere. Uh, he, Lincoln's Bicentennial on February 12th. I actually I thought it was your birthday. You seem to appear more than Lincoln. Now, that was fun. His most recent book today is Monument Men and the Life and Art of Daniel Chester French. It's a Princeton Architectural Press. 367 pages, profusely illustrated, and it's $35. And this was a fun book to read, something I didn't know much about. And uh, it was nice to get, you know, we all know who French was and right. we admire him, but not the minutia of his life. And this is a compendium of that and spectacular pieces. I want to first ask you uh, to describe French's personality and character. What was he like? He was. Um a chilly, reserved New Englander. Hard guy to write about because he didn't talk a lot. Like he Lincoln. Yeah, I think Lincoln was funnier though. He's about himself. He was funny. Lincoln told long stories, French did not. Yeah. He was a tease. You know, he would tease All people. Right. Uh, to give you an example of how tough a subject this guy was, as a life force or as a writer, someone once said to him, Mr. French, you have such a wonderful sense of humor. You remind me of President Coolidge. Oh, yeah. I know, but that passed for high Yankee humor, and also a New Englander. Well, President Coolidge had uh, Bora, Senator Bora from Idaho in his office one day and spied the Vice President, Charles Dawes, walking across Pennsylvania Avenue outside the Oval Office. And Coolidge said, there goes the Vice President with nothing on his mind but my health. <laughs> so there's Coolidge. One upsmanship. Go, do it. At a dinner at the White House, a woman sat next to Coolidge who didn't really talk to her. And he, she said, You know, I bet you, I bet someone that I could get you to say three words at dinner. And he said, You lose. Exactly. That's a good story. <laughs> so maybe he was witty. But that was what French's humor was like. He was a tease. Mm -hmm. um, but he wasn't very outgoing then? No, he was so consumed by his work, mm -hmm. by art, by perspective, by his vision. He was just, he lived to wake up in the morning and go to whatever studio he was working at and work on seven projects at once for different public commissions. Mm -hmm. And then wash up and have social life, either in New York or in the Berkshires. And he had a very routine, routinized life. It wasn't a routine life. And somehow he not only became a successful artist, but a celebrity and a very, very wealthy man. Yes. He was yes. successful. Oh, yes, he was. Um, what, who were some of his mentors? Uh, and I know his father was important to him as well. His father was crucial. Um, his father, 
was a deputy treasury secretary who openly gave him jobs for the treasury department. Uh, building of new treasury departments, post offices. Guess who got the commission to do the statues at the top? Daniel Chester French. Do give it to my boy. And it was only per diem work, but it was something to occupy him and keep him in the public mind. Another person who was important to him was our friend Benjamin Brown French, mm -hmm. superintendent of public buildings under Lincoln, who um, took um, French to meet General Grant uh, in the Grant administration and was very helpful introducing him to patrons in Washington, D.C. And one more. He had an older brother whom he adored, and uh, he also, to his father's horror, also became interested in art. Hmm. I mean, his father wanted his kids to be lawyers. And um, he became the first and long-serving director of the Art Institute of Chicago, William M. R. French, quite a Chicago celebrity. He was the director of the Institute for years and years, and also helped French, helped Dan when he came here to do the, the Great World's Fair of 1893. We'll they lived together, yeah. Um, tell us some of your sources. I mean, this book is just filled with some good minutia about his business affairs. Are his business records available? Are they kept every, every bill, mm -hmm. unlike us. He kept every bill. Yeah, that's right. Um, he kept elaborate records. How, you know what's not in his records? How did, and someone asked me this earlier today at the Civil War Roundtable here. How did he, how did he demand his price? I mean, he gets $50,000 for the Lincoln Memorial, ultimately adds to, the, adds to it, because he makes the statue bigger. How did he sell them? And we don't know. He didn't write that down. Mm -hmm. He never wrote a letter saying, I will not do that work for 38000 I need forty five. He wanted flexibility. Well, he, I think he did that in person. But he kept meticulous records. Um, and you're right. I, you know me. I like to get to the original sources, newspapers, his letters, and everything was saved. He had a daughter. I was just going to ask you about the daughter. How important did you, did you find her letters and papers? Let me tell you a link that will make you appreciate his daughter more. When I was a very young man and a newlywed, my wife and I went up to interview Stephen Laurent, the great writer of Lincoln Photograph Books, and he was a wonderful man. So this is 1971. We went up to meet him in Lenox, Massachusetts. He took us to lunch at the Red Lion Inn, this legendary inn. And then he said, do you know who Daniel Chester French is? I said, of course. He said, I'm going to take you to his studio. Um, his daughter has just died, but she and I were very close, and he winked. And there in the studio were all of the models that French had done, you know, small clay models, plaster models. Maquettes. Maquettes. And in, and in one of the studio rooms was a bust and he said, do you know who that is? And I said, well, it looks sort of like you. Daniel Chester French did a bust of you? He said, no, no, I'm not that old. He said, Peggy did. So the daughter was a sculptor and the apple of her father's eye. And she did a bust of Stephen Laurent. How's that for a Lincoln connection? I love it. Yeah. I don't know where it is, by the way. The, um, so she had numerous reminiscences of her father. Yes, she wrote a book about her father, as did the wife. And that's from the papers. Did you get into the papers themselves? Absolutely. So there are copies of the papers at Chesterwood, mm -hmm. and one of his former studios, the one he built late in life to get away from the crowds at his first studio, has copies of all of the papers. But the originals are in at Williams College, which is about 40 miles north. Chesterwood donated it, donated the papers to Williams because they didn't have adequate climate control. And Williams has done a great job. The first thing we did when we got to the original papers was look at his bird watching diary. Mm -hmm. Dan was, as I say, a meticulous record keeper. And when he was a teenager, he became an avid bird watcher. Um, he was 15 the year that, uh, the spring that Abraham Lincoln died. The first thing I did is turn to April 14th and April 15th, 1865. This would have been a great opening for the book. Did he mention this national calamity? If you look at diaries from everybody in the country, Everyone. they stop on April 14th and 15th and say, a terrible thing has happened or a wonderful thing has happened. Mary Chestnut, he's dead. Yeah, exactly. Ding dong, right? Yeah. Guess what he wrote on April 15th, 1865? First ruby-tailed, you know, fleckled uh, bird of the spring. That's all he wrote. Oh my. Tunnel vision. Yeah. So sadly, he never took notice. His wife, his future wife, 
who was his first cousin and lived in Washington, was much younger. But she reminisced about the voices she heard outside the windows of people murmuring. The, her uncle Benjamin brought her a piece of crepe from the catafalque, which is in Williams College now. It's much different sensibility. In your book, you have, <clears throat> I think I counted them, uh, 83 public works that are listed. Is there a catalog resume of him, uh, <clears throat> of those works and more, or, or is that the entire oeuvre? Um, yeah, we have a complete listing of the public The public statue. statue. Yeah. Um, the, only, the only books, again, have been by his daughter, his wife, by a wonderful scholar named Michael Richmond, who did a lot of work on him in the 70s. But he wrote a catalog about maybe 15 or 20 selected works mm -hmm. that he put into a major exhibition. So there, I, you know, do we need a catalog resume? I don't know, but I was writing a life story, and he is all over the country. You know, well, I was going to ask you, give us a rundown of the public output you did. Where are they? Which what? Okay. Which ones are outstanding to you, and how many more might be privately held? Well, his great work for the Chicago World's Fair burned the down. Republic. The Republic. It burned up because it was made out of a very, you know, a, a, a solution of glycerin and burlap. And uh, and paste, not the best thing to put up in Chicago. Would you? But not you know. before 1871. But the copy of it, which he made in 1913, some say for the anniversary of the fair, some say for the statehood bicentennial of Illinois, mm -hmm. or centennial. Centennial. Yeah, we both got right. these wrong. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We're one. We're even. So that one stands right in front of where President Obama's, I guess you don't call it a presidential library now, no? where the Obama Center will be. The gilded version of the statue is right there. So if the Obama Center is built, I think the Republic will have a new life. So that's a major one. The standing Lincoln in Lincoln, Nebraska, which he that's did before Lincoln. the Lincoln Memorial. That's his first Lincoln. Um, here in Chicago, he did this beautiful um, romanticized tribute to Marshall Field. Mm -hmm which um, is a goddess seated in a throne that looks like the throne he would do for the Lincoln Memorial. So he had his shtick that he was developing. Uh, Concord, Massachusetts, his hometown. That was his first commission now. It has the Minuteman, yeah. which is as iconic in its way as the Lincoln Memorial. The icon, the symbol, the brand of everything from the first Jello, ready in a minute, to the National Rifle Association, the savings bonds, war bonds. Um, his statue of Emerson in Concord, Massachusetts. His brilliant Civil War memorial called Morning Victory, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. Um, in New York, the Continents at uh, the Battery, which interestingly, and I know you might want to talk about this later, these four statues representing four continents in front of the, um, um, the Custom House, which is now the Museum of the American Indian in New York, is right at the spot where the uh, Patriots tore down or pulled down the statue of King George III mm -hmm. after the declaration was read to New York for the first time. Did they, they know that when they were erecting those? Uh, they put it there yeah. for that reason? Um, I, they didn't put it there for that reason. It was prime real estate. They wanted the Custom House to face the water mm -hmm. on the other side. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting because iconoclasm in, in the United States is not a new phenomenon. And there are other great works. Um, the Lincoln Memorial, of course, is separate and apart. It's so spectacular, everything about it, the monumentality, the uses that it's been put to as a national we'll get to backdrop. That, and um, in Washington, the DuPont Circle Memorial is, is quite beautiful. Um, he did a Hooker Memorial in front of the Boston State House, a beautiful, underappreciated General Grant in Philadelphia. Yeah, okay, we'll talk about that. And too. lots of cemetery monuments. Well, the cemetery movement, the rural cemetery movement that came from the Civil War really was still raging, I think, and that's probably one of the reasons. And that's why he's in the Boston uh, Rural Cemetery and in the Concord. Of course, we know Lincoln was and Mary were big supporters of the rural cemetery yes, movement themselves. Yes, they were. And that's also Edward Everett, why he was at Gettysburg for that matter, because he was one of the major... And I think he helped found the Boston Cemetery, yeah. where... Uh, French's Millmore Memorial is one of his greatest Another works. Another we'll talk about. All okay. the other ones are great. He has okay. too many greatest. What about his foreign statuary? There's George Washington in uh, Paris. Yes. What others are there? Almost nothing. Okay. So he did the George Washington as the, as a, it was Daughters of the American Revolution Commission to give to the people of Paris. And it's 
lucky that it's, it's in a great spot. It's in front of the Guimet, which is the Museum of Asian Art in Paris, the Place d'Iena. And it's, you know, Washington holding his sword when he accepts his commission. Guess who they hired as the band leader for that dedication ceremony? John Philip Sousa. Uh -huh. Not bad. Not bad. A good commission for him. Yeah. Um, well, what years were he, was he most prolific, would you say? Is it an upward trend, or was there a what? Oh, yeah. It's, it's like a day at the Dow Jones. You know, it's steady, then 1890s to 1915, and then, you know, he lives, he works until he's almost 81. He's still working on a marble uh, nude, which he cares very much about, um, you know, his definition of beauty. And he's also working um, on a Daniel Webster, um, which he never quite finishes. One of his last finished works is of William Seward huh. for Florida, New York, his birthplace. Uh, let's talk about his methodology and maybe his okay. work habits a little bit. How did he research his subjects? Uh, and what was his methodology in creating these large public statues? Okay, that's two big questions. It's two big questions. Yes. So Start with the first one. How did he research? A, well, um, he was a very meticulous researcher. When he was doing angels, which became one of his specialties for cemeteries, he would call his childhood friend William Brewster, the most famous expert on birds, the most famous ornithologist in America, and he would say, I need wings, and he would send him bird wings in the mail. And this was before FedEx. I don't know how they shipped, but they shipped. And he would have wings in his, so he would study living subjects. He had many live models. When he did the George Washington, he hired a big local kid who he thought was built like George Washington. He didn't like he didn't want to imagine the, the uh, clothes, so he used the telephone. This is 1899, 1900, and he called a costume shop in New York City, and he sent the boy down on the train from Stockbridge, Massachusetts to New York, and he, model and he found a Revolutionary War style from a theater company and wore a Washington uniform when he was posing after that. So lots of research on costumes, on weapons. Concord, Massachusetts has a great little museum. And in that museum is the coat that French studied from who uh, owned by a descendant of a Revolutionary War Minuteman, a green velvet coat with big buttons, and that's what he used to fashion the coat. He, they, they, they have the powder horn that he used to make the powder horn from the Minuteman, the, the musket. So he was a meticulous researcher. And where Lincoln was concerned, he became friends with Frederick Hill Meserve, the first great collector and chronicler of Lincoln photographs. And Meserve sent to him one of his wonderful, now prized, rare editions of Lincoln He's photographs. He's in the subscribers list in there. Yeah. Now, just for oh, that's great. Did, I uh, should have asked you about that. Did he use that as well for Nebraska? Yes, for Lincoln? he used it for both. The Meserve, but yeah. when he got to the Lincoln Memorial, he asked, um, he asked Meserve to send him some prints of his favorite photographs. But you search in vain for one photograph that informed did, the Lincoln did he, Memorial. Uh, did he use the Nebraska one at all, or did he just try to do it I think he did. differently? I think he did. The downcast head is definitely a French innovation. It's downcast more than St. Gaudens did his standing Lincoln downcast in Chicago. Yes, which is gorgeous. It's gorgeous. And that was the great rivalry. They had an interesting relationship. Um, Talk Saint, to us a little bit about not only St. Gaudens, but his contemporaries. What right. did they think of him? And also, what did he think of them? He was a really great mentor of young sculptors. The only one I can find that he didn't like was Borglum. Hmm. Borglum interrupted a meeting of the American Sculpture Society when French was chairing. And he had never heard of, never seen such behavior. Imagine the saying point of order during a meeting that Daniel Chester French is holding. He did not like that, but he encouraged women sculptors, he employed them, he encouraged generations of young sculptors, really loved him. He, and I know we're skipping around, Please, French took the sculpture seat on the board of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. He served on the board for 25, 30 years. He was practically well, de facto, he was the curator of American sculpture at the Met because they had no curator. He was the head of the Acquisitions Committee for American Sculpture. When St. Gaudens died, he bought all the St. Gaudens medals and small bronzes that he could. 
and he sold his own work to the museum, which you're not allowed to do anymore. Yeah. Uh, he was a great collector and a and a and a patron of what American sculpture. What happened to that sculpture. collection after his passing? The St. Gaudens? It's uh, at the Met. It's at the Met. Oh, oh yes. We have the largest collect. We. I still say we I at know the exactly. Met. Well, I'm on the board now. I don't have his seat, but I have, I'm have. i a, a government-appointed board member. But it's it's a nice continuum. Um, on the subject of what they thought of, what he thought of older sculptors, he loved Thomas Ball, mm -hmm. the sculptor of the Lincoln and Kneeling Slave yes. in Washington. Um, he loved John Quincy Adams Ward. He was very helpful to his widow in getting a completed um, statue of Sheridan done in Albany, for which he gave Ward complete credit. And But St. Gaudens and he had a strange relationship. You know, St. Gaudens was a little older, but seemed more grand and more successful. And as long as St. Gaudens lived, St. Gaudens was the most famous and renowned American sculptor. When General Sherman died, St. Gaudens and French were called to the house to make a death mask. St. Gordon said to French, you do the plaster, and French did, which is good for the, for the um, catalog raisonné. Yes, exactly. But St. Gordon's ordered him around. Hmm. St. Gordon's died young, or he probably, let's say there would have at least have been a competition for the Lincoln Memorial, because French didn't have any competitors at that point, and yeah. he got the job without having to submit a proposal or anything. And he was on the board. He was the head of the board. And he, well, that's, yes, he managed to be the head of the National Commission for Fine yeah, Arts. Exactly. Yeah. I know. Now, he had his, uh, of course, studio. He had a number of studios, he of did. course, during that time. Here is uh, one of them uh, mm -hmm. that is in a Scribner's article uh, that I don't know if you can see it very well, but uh, there is one of the studios. And I think there's a Lincoln, uh, oh, right there. You can so see can a I Lincoln just do bus. one correction? Yes, so you this may. is not his studio. This is the studio of his marble carvers. And I ah. should have answered your question about process to get to this. Yes. But, um, did he, and, and that, did, whether he had his own foundry, too. Yes. Um, so, A, yes, a lot of studios. Washington, Boston, Concord, Massachusetts, New York City, and Stockbridge, Massachusetts. And for a while at Aspit, he had a barn near St. Gaudens' estate because mm -hmm. they were, again, he had a junior-senior relationship. Um, so his process. He was not Michelangelo, okay? He did not get a block of marble delivered to the house and begin and spend 20 years chipping away until David emerged. Right. Did he draw first what he wanted? He drew the Minuteman, but there were no there are no sketches. After a while, he did use a blackboard, we know that. And chalk is about as fugitive a material as you can get, so obviously none of that exists, but he had blackboards in his studios. Now his idea of a sketch was to take a piece of clay and mold it and magically the, the, the design would appear and he would make very few changes. That's how he did the Lincoln Memorial. One day he started with the clay and a few days later he had what he wanted and except for a little bit of the positioning of the legs and hands, it never, it never changed after that. It was the enthroned Lincoln we know. Okay, so he finishes that. He's got a 12 inch model of let's say the Lincoln Memorial. Then he does a three-foot model. Then his plasterers come in and make a mold. Then from that, he does a six-foot model. Again, the plasterers make the mold. He does not have his own foundry. The Minuteman went to a bronze foundry. And the Lincoln Memorial, which he was going to do in bronze, by the way, good thing he changed because it's a perfect match of interior and sculpture. If it had been bronze, I don't think it would have been as great a success. Think of the Jefferson Memorial. Mm -hmm. which is fine, but the bronze standing Jefferson is not the same. It's colder. It's colder. 28 blocks of Georgia marble were delivered to the studio that you showed in that drawing, the studio of the Pichirilli brothers in the Bronx, not far from where Yankee Stadium would rise within a year of the Lincoln Memorial dedication. And French would go up there a few times a week and play with the... But they carved it. They would have the plaster model on one side and the marble on the other, and they carved it to French's specifications. And some people say, well, but then he didn't sculpt the Lincoln Memorial. The Pichirilli brothers did. Mm -hmm. Well, technically they carved it, but it's French's sculpture. That was par for the course. Different than many professors with their research assistants <laughs> today. Well, it's an interesting, it's an interesting comparison. <laughs> but French was the designer and the sculptor, and clearly could sculpt, 
but he gave it over to the cutters and the foundry. Ladies and gentlemen watching out on the internet, uh, if you would like one of these books, it's really a lot of fun. And you'll learn a lot of someone you don't really know and you know about because of the memorial uh, in Washington. And I recommend it for uh, uh, casual people as well as those who really want to get into the minutia. I think you're going to find both there. You have one chapter called The Genius of Creation. What was French's genius? I, I find genius unknowable. I mean, I, I don't understand how musicians can sit down at the piano and you and I have gone to concerts together and how they could play a piece without reading the music. And it's not only that they know it, which is amazing in itself, but they interpret it and they make it beautiful or compose it. Let's say, you know, I, have, I just don't, I admire it. I'm awed by it. What made this kid whose father was a judge and a farmer and an educator and who so wanted his sons to be into the same legal professionalism that he was, why are they able, how can they do it? They, they learned making snowmen in Concord. They learned getting clay from the store and putting a turtle on their father's plate to scare him or a snake or a frog. I, I don't, I, I can't conceive of having that kind of talent. But he not only had great hands, he had an, a, a brilliant eye. I'll give you an, an example. The Lincoln Memorial, uh, some, some people in the Lincoln Memorial Commission wanted St. Gordon's statue to be replicated in the Lincoln Memorial, save money. And then they said to French, well, you must do a stand, if you get the commission, you have to do a standing Lincoln. French said, if we do a standing Lincoln, people standing outside on the bottom of the steps will not see his eyes. They'll see up to his chest. He envisioned that in a second. You and I, at least I, would not get that sense that it had to be seated so it could be equally majestic and visible from the bottom step as from the top. Just had the eye. Um, his first commission, as we talked about in Concord, the Minutemen. Uh, you know, I think we think back of Abraham Lincoln and his first elective office was captain of the Black Hawk War. Of the, all the successes I've had, that's the one that has given me the most pleasure. He said, during the nomination for the, the presidency. What was that first commission to French? Scary. He gets the job because he's the hometown boy. They won't pay him. They'll give him expenses. He creates the model, they don't like it. He revises it, he uses the young, again a young man to, in the neighborhood to pose. Apparently a lot of local women who thought that Dan was a very handsome guy, found Revolutionary War artifacts in their attics and made a beeline for his studio, so he spent a lot of time entertaining. And when he f was ready to do the model, uh, the plaster, he turned his clay upside down, they poured the plaster in and it, the head almost broke off. His father and he were holding the head to save it from being destroyed. So basically he didn't know what he was doing, but he had a vision of this yeoman farmer hearing a distant shot and being called to save the Republic, even though he wasn't against the British, again, not against professional soldiers. So he learns the process as he, as he, as he goes along. And um, it's, it's a remarkable thing. But he wasn't, he wouldn't come to the dedication. He was in Italy studying with Thomas Ball, and he was invited. It was a big, big deal. Um, President Ulysses Grant made it. Um, I still can't remember in my head which general, Hooker, Meade, or Burnside, one of them came up here um, for the event and led the parade from downtown Concord out to the old bridge. He wouldn't come back, and it was an enormous success. His father stood in for him. Uh, Louisa May Alcott was there, and Ralph Waldo Emerson was there. It was a huge deal, but he was afraid. Well, he must have felt very good about it afterward because he allowed many reproductions to be produced. No, he made to many make, reproductions. To make royalties. Yes. But did he, so he oversaw it himself. I thought I saw in the book that there was someone who made it, and in fact, you even said someone, uh, Thomas Starr. 
sold uh, sold a bronze, and you you said that for four hundred dollars with twenty five percent commission going to start. Well, you're right. He had different arrangements, but he learned to have control over his own. He controlled it himself. And when he did the bronze, he made it a little bit different, so it could still be his. And someone wrote to him once and said, I was in a club in New York, and I saw a reproduction of the Minuteman, and it had someone else's name on it. Well, the French went crazy. He hired um, copyright, and he should. It was his work, and he didn't get paid for it, but he made up for it. Let me tell you a story about the Nebraska Lincoln. He, you know, the Nebraska Lincoln was not a huge, huge success. It was a great event. William Jennings Bryan gave the dedicatory speech. He asked everyone in the audience who had seen Abraham Lincoln to raise their hands. And there were a lot of people. Well, it's only 46 years after Lincoln's death. I mean, we can still talk about Kennedy. There are people, lots of people who saw John F. Kennedy still with us. Um, but um, he began selling reproductions of the Nebraska Standing Lincoln right away. And he forgot to tie up that right. He got an enormous amount of money, and they thought they had the rights. So it was a little bit of a legal dispute. He was, became a really good businessman, as well as a good artist. So he controlled these images and went into the reduction business. That's what we call them, not reproductions, reductions. reductions. Uh, I don't know if you really studied this at all, but um, do any of these reproductions, reductions, come up on the market today? Do you have a general idea what they the do. pricing is of them? I saw a... Webster or Seward recently at an auction, and I was very tempted, but as you know, I've become a non-collector in the last year. Um, Medical science would like to know how you did that. I wouldn't want any of my clients to know how, but. Well, after coming into a new shop, I said, the first thing I said to you was, you, you make me want to start again. And there have people who have started again. Yes, they have. So once More we have a new want. place to live, we may, we may do that. I'll beat your front door. Bring the divorce lawyer. All right. Um, but, but um, yes, they are collectible. The, the Minutemen are very expensive. The Standing Lincolns are very expensive. They sell nice reproductions at Chesterwood, his studio, mm -hmm. made by the National Trust. And even those are expensive. But, yeah, you do see them. Uh, they come up at auction, fine art auctions, all the time. Um, one of his, I'm not sure well known, it's now well known to me, I've read the book, is uh, Martin Milmore. Uh, and his memorial to Milmore, which you say was the most acclaimed work in the 1890s and a very ambitious work at that. Who was Milmore and how is that, uh, well, who was Milmore? So Martin Milmore was uh, a rival of his, um, Irish-born American sculptor, did a wonderful Lincoln. Yeah. I owned one. Um, they're out there. And um, he died young. Some say he drank a little too much but he died young. And his brother and his sister commissioned a tribute to him for the Boston Cemetery. Um, what French decided to do was very unusual at the time. He would paint a realistic paint, sculpt a realistic Milmore, but from the back, working on one of his last pieces, a sphinx, at the same Mount Auburn Cemetery in Boston. And he would do the angel of death, staying his hand, as they say, for right interrupting him. And people had not done symbolic figures and realistic figures before in tandem. He really brought it off. I mean, it is, as a sculpture in high relief, with low relief, meaning the sphinx in the background, it's a really, um, it's a technological marvel. It's an impressive piece. By the way, he did... He did Milmore naked first, mm -hmm. and then dressed him with clay. Mm -hmm. And I know sculptors now who work the same way. They do a naked figure first, and they then they the put figure. clothes on. Well, they feel they have to. They can't just do someone in a suit. Mm -hmm. They have to do the musculature first. Sure, and makes sense. It's a lot of work. Yeah. Anyway, so the Milmore goes to Mount Auburn Cemetery, and it's a triumph. Although they fight about the base and other things. Now when. I know we haven't gotten to the World's Columbian Exhibition, okay. but when they build a palace of arts, French is put in charge of what sculptures go in. If you blow up the surviving picture of the palace and you get right to the center of the floor, guess what's there? Milmore. So he installed his own great success as a tourist attraction 
at the World's Fair of 1893 here in Chicago. Who were his, well, if we can go back, Bjorn, to that, to the Millmore, in, well, something interesting that you said about it is how he made death hooded mm -hmm. and almost comforting. You want to talk a bit about that? I mean, in fact, in fact, you know, and of course, leaves no narrative clues to why he did that. And you know, we we can talk as well going into that from the Grant statue, and and the emotions that I th I came out of that because uh, it did. You talked about Michelangelo, and in a way, even though there's the finished product, it seems still he's coming out of that. Yeah. I see Grant kind of oozing with strength and. So Stolid person, slogging. How did, how did French create to you? How did French create emotions of death and even of Grant? You know, again, you're the the and question Jews. of of yeah. It, it, but he thinks about it. With Grant, he spoke to uh, Grant's son. He said, "How would your father look on the battlefield? Would he look like my Hooker statue, standing proud, sitting proudly on a horse?" No, said uh, Fred. He would be wearing a, an overcoat that was too big for him uh, in the rain. That's how I remember my father, chomping on a cigar. He didn't do the cigar. But, and, and French said to him, why, why would he wear an overcoat too large? Are you sure? And he said, yeah, I, we still have the overcoat. Well, that was all French needed to hear. So he gets to see the overcoat and makes him look like he's dwarfed by his own environment, yet the power is still there. With death saying the hand of the sculptor, he did not want death to be frightening. He wanted death to be comforting. Uh, the tragedy not being, uh, not so much being the death of a young man, but the interruption of art being made. Mm. He wrote about this? No. Very this little. Is interpretation then. Yeah. I love it. Even though the two people who have written about the book so far have made very pointedly upfront noted that I was not an art historian. Just because he worked at an art museum, it doesn't mean he's an art historian, which is fine. I'm, I'm trying to be a biographer here. That's how I see it. Mm -hmm. um, and by the way, I did rely on the art critics of the day. So one thing that is not evident in every biography of an artist, instead of playing the art historian and interpreting every work, I'd rather do the critical appraisals that appeared in the papers when these works came out to get a range of what they said, because they, A, they're art critics, B, this is what the public was told immediately after these sculptures were created, from the Lincoln Memorial to the Republic here in Chicago to the Grant. By the way, he got always got good reviews, except for the Republic, interestingly. Yeah, uh, Laredo Taft didn't like that, really. He was one who kind of came out. But we'll get to that also, because um, a question came in that uh, reminded me about his Cornish estate, which is in uh, New Hampshire. St. Gordon's. Uh, St. Gordon's was, yeah. yes. I'm sorry. And that um, did he ever, I mean, that's not that far from Robert Lincoln. Uh, was, were, did they ever meet? And, and also then, St. Gordon's or? Um, St. Gordon's, then French. Uh, Mel Maurer of Westlake, Ohio asked, please discuss French's relationship with Robert Lincoln. So how did he get to Robert Lincoln as well? St. Gordon's first. St. Gordon's um, uh, knew Robert because of the Chicago Commission. Mm -hmm. Abraham Lincoln II unveiled that statue here in Chicago in 1887. So it was very much a family approval process. Um, and then French knows St. Gaudens and lives at Aspet for one summer to work with alongside St. Gaudens. So when French does the Lincoln Memorial models, he is only about, well, it's about an hour and a half today to get from um, Chesterwood to Manchester, Vermont, and Hildy. You would have thought it was Donald Trump and Kim arranging a summit. Hmm. Uh, Robert says, you should come up here with a model. French says, I'll see you when you're down here. While well, I'll be in New York, Robert's in New York. Well, will you come to the studio? Maybe you should bring it to the office. They never met on this project. The only time they, but they corresponded. So Robert is involved with this. But when Robert becomes really useful, and that's how Dan thinks of other people, not inspiring but useful, is when French decides after looking at the newly completed interior of the memorial, holy mackerel, I proposed a 12-foot high statue. It's going to be lost in this atrium. It's just going to vanish. I've made a terrible mistake. 
He went to Congress. He said, I need another $25,000. They said, are you crazy? So he constructed a plaster head on the scale of an enlarged 19-foot statue. He had it hoisted to the top of the atrium on ropes, exactly in the position that it would hold and does hold today. And then he asked Robert Lincoln, come and see the head in the site. And that's when Robert Lincoln came and said, well, this is perfect. You can't do anything smaller than this. And so he go. got him there. But you know, French acted as if he was the president of the United Sculptor Society. I'm making that name up. And French liked to have the upper hand. And he was quite grand at the end. I mean, he was an important man. And he thought Robert should come to his studio like everybody else did and see it in the studio. Robert had an Isaac idea Russo. of himself, yeah. No, but they met. He goes, all right. It worked. Um, and Robert, of course, was at the dedication. Yes. Which was amazing. This is. And there's you know, a the picture 20s. of him uh, with uh, French, uh, with the background of the pillars, the Greek pillars there. Um, we have a question from uh, Louise Pope in Washington, D.C. Hello, Louise. Nice to be seen. I can't see you, sorry. Uh, <laughs> congratulations on writing such a wonderful book. Uh, we did mention, I uh, thought you mentioned, you did a catalog, his 83 sculptors, uh, at least the public ones, are the catalog with locations. Uh, and we already talked about some that you would recommend. But so they're briefly, listed by state. Yes. So in the back of the book is a listing. You know, I go through the highlights and the commissions and the work we know most, most uh, uh, intimately, that are most familiar to us. But in the back is sort of a, a tourist guide. Um, and there is a man I've never met, a, mu a professional musician, uh, quite an accomplished one from what I understand. Never met him. I give him a shout out in the book and the acknowledgement. Almost any s French sculptor in the country, this, I think his name is Douglas Yeo, Y-E-O. If you go online and do Douglas Yeo, French Marshall Field sculpture in Chicago, he's visited it, photographed it, and has comments. So he's quite a resource himself. We have another question from Starkville, Mississippi. Ah, who I might know that, that be? Gene Marzalek, I hope, because John shouldn't be uh, doing... Uh, it's John, and uh, he says you are universally considered one of the leading Lincoln scholars now writing. How did you choose, and maybe why did you choose, Daniel Chester French as a topic of this latest book? Well, first, big shout out to John, one of the great yes, historians in the country. Exactly. He's been, he sat in this seat as well. I know, I feel his presence. Um, so I did it the old-fashioned way. I was asked to do it. Um, you know, inspiration comes in different ways. I never believed that anybody would want a biography of this sculptor that I feel I've come to know and felt before. The National Trust, this, this year, which is the year of publication, is celebrating the 50th anniversary of the transfer of the house from Daniel French's daughter to the National Trust. To mark that occasion, they wanted a, a finally to have a biography that was not written by a loving daughter or a you know, first cousin slash wife. So they asked me to do it. So I would say it was like when they asked Daniel French to, they commissioned him without competition. That's what happened to me. So I felt very flattered and very honored. Well, I didn't realize so how hard, much work it would be, but that's all right. So I need to put you in a corner and ask you to do something I've asked before. We need a book on the life portraits of Lincoln. And I know you've done some work on it. And maybe I'll still get you to that if we can find some research assistance. Have I mentioned system. how generous the National Trust was in financing this project? I just thought I'd throw that in. Oh, since sure. You're still trying to do the rush. Well, talking about, that, uh, talking about that, talking about that, you you speak briefly or not so briefly in the in the book of Edward Clark Potter. Uh, he was important. What other philanthropists and and associates did French have throughout his life? Very briefly, Henry Bacon, Ch young Chicago architect, worked on the World's Columbian Exposition, moved to New York. He becomes the designer of French's monuments. Uh, the Spirit of Life in Saratoga, the, um, the Lincoln Memorial, the, Nebra the Camp Lincoln, Nebraska Memorial with the Gettysburg Address on the slab in the back. So they become terrific collaborators. It's Bacon who gets to hire French for the Lincoln Memorial, but you'd never know it from their correspondence that Bacon was in charge. 
That's his most important collaborator. His brother, William, is a collaborator because he nurtures him, he pushes him. He buys his plaster casts after they've been on display in studios. You know, the Art Institute got rid of most of the plaster casts of Daniel Chester French, which I would be angry about had I, do, had I not understood the policy from my Met days. Both of those museums were founded in the same year, 150 years ago next year. They both started with collections of plaster casts because they didn't have art, so they had copies. French's stuff simply supplemented that collection of copies. But when the Art Institute and the Met began collecting works of art, they didn't need the plaster copies. So little by little, they were deaccessioned. And did they go anywhere? Or they went nowhere. One of one gone? of them went. Yeah, they were all gone. Um, and uh, Peggy, French's daughter, was very unhappy. She wrote really brutal letters to the Art Institute mm -hmm. when she found out that they had been, you know, why, why didn't she get a chance to recover them for her home? Anyway, um, let's talk for a moment about the White City, because we're, we're here. And uh, he won that commission, which is of the Republic, as we spoke about, which was a signature piece. It was right in the middle of the whole affair. Uh, for right the 18, the, over a basin, it was amazing. Over a basin. Where people would go by in gondolas. Yes, yeah. exactly. Uh, 1893, World Columbian Exposition, known as the White City. And uh, why did St. Gaudens not do that piece? I don't know. St. Gaudens, very gentle. And I think this is why French became a mentor as well. St. Gaudens said, give it to French. Let him be the the whole deal at the World's Columbian Exposition. He ran the, the committee that selected other sculptors to be shown in the building, the Palace of Fine Arts. He sent his own stuff. He did the Columbus on a chariot for the top of the building that overlooked the basin and had Lake Michigan in the back. He did the Teamster. He did lots of work on the fair. And all of it was, again, in this kind of fugitive material made shiny by glycerin that was not going to last. By the way, the Republic did burn down in that lagoon eventually yes. when the city was abandoned. Yeah. It must have been the most breathtaking place. I've gone through these archival pictures that were taken by the official photographer. It was unbelievable. It was grand and people came from everywhere, all, everywhere to be there and it was a huge success. Uh, it was although a, a little bit maybe not like the World's Fair in New York, not but, like the New York World's Fair of 1964. No, was I was there. No. Did you see the Lincoln? I did. Yeah, yeah, the mechanical. The mechanical. Lincoln. Oh, that was that came out of uh, Disney with yep. Ralph Newman, who founded and whose our voice, shop. Whose voice was Lincoln? Remind me. Royal Dano, the actor okay. in the Red Badge of Courage, who is one of the soldiers who talks to Audie Murphy along the way. Anyway, um, but the White City was breathtaking. It, the architecture was amazing. Daniel Burnham uh, was the architect. He later did Union Station in Washington, considered for a while as a site for the Lincoln Memorial. Mm -hmm. They had lots of bad sites that they were thinking yeah, of. Yeah, well, well, we'll get to that in a second, okay. uh, or the sites of that. Uh, I was, you know, French, you write, wanted to eclipse August Berthold's Statue of Liberty. Yes, the Statue of Liberty. It didn't really happen. No. Um, it wasn't as acclaimed as the Statue of Liberty from the beginning. And the Statue of Liberty mm. was made out of copper. It was going to last. Mean, yeah. yeah. But think of this. The halo on the, uh, the, on the Republic was lit by Westinghouse bulbs. Yeah, and it was that. the beginning of... This whole city was electrified. Yeah. There was a Ferris wheel here. Huge. We're just trying to get it lar as large or close to it. They just on Navy Pier. They just uh, really? reinvented it. Yes. I didn't know it, whether it was large or not, but just it was, it was the first Ferris wheel. Huge Mr. Gondola. Ferris operated. That's right. It. Yeah. Exactly. And they just made it. it was, it's an interesting story. So Clarence I'm Day. I couldn't not use this little tidbit. Clarence Day, the, who would become the author of uh, Life with Father. Um, no, no, he was uh, cheaper by the dozen, right? Clarence Day? Yes. Yeah. He, his father let him come to the White City by himself when he was a teenager. And he wrote back to his father that he had spent all of his money on the Hoochie Coochie Girl Pavilion, seeing girls dancing. So he needed money to go to the museums as well. His father said, here's the money, but you'd better go to the museums. So that was his indoctrination into traveling alone. That's what kind of a tourist attraction it was. Oh, yes, positively. Yeah. 
Um, I don't want to talk about Chesterwood very much, uh, but oh, they not cheaper, as I was told. That's what it, no? All right, no. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Chesterwood, which is country estate. Uh, I just want to ask you, as a New Yorker yourself, he said uh, that oh, what that. he mean by the estate was like heaven, but New York is, well, New York. Comment as a New Yorker for us. Well, I would love to have a country estate to spend the summer in, too, and then be in New York in season, quote unquote, in the art season, in the exhibition season. He, he visited St. Gaudens at Aspet, and he thought that was the way a great sculptor should live. You have a city studio, and you have an estate with artists living around you. So he, he and his wife looked for a year till they stumbled on Stockbridge, Massachusetts. They went up to this dilapidated farm, and again, he had a great eye. Monument Mountain was on one side, farms on the other. There was just a shack, a farmhouse, but they, he saw what the possibilities were. He had a barn studio. They said, you could use the barn as a studio. He hauled the barn up a hill and had Henry Bacon design a new studio, and Bacon designed the mansion. And it was a great community. Edith Wharton lived nearby. Um, Isadora Duncan danced in his estate. So it was quite the place. Let's, let's jump. We've, we've talked all over the place about the Lincoln Memorial, but let's just talk about a few different things about it quickly. Sure. Um, how was the location finally devolved? It, as you said, there were numbers of places in Washington they were thinking about. Well, Joe Cannon, the Speaker of the House, did not Uncle want Joe. West, but Uncle Joe did not, when he had seen Lincoln in the flesh, so he felt he had a proprietary interest and right, did not want the Lincoln Memorial in what he called the goddamn swamp of West Potomac Park. You know, there was no bridge. He said, if you put it there, I'm putting it in Arlington. In slave territory. What difference? Well, Washington was slave territory too. So it was, no one could agree on a site. Do you know who gave the dispositive testimony at the hearing to decide? John M. Hay, Abraham Lincoln's old private secretary, Secretary of State of the United States at that point. He said. Possible forger, but go ahead. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. The alleged author of the Bixby letter. That too. Um, he said. Lincoln should be remote, but not too remote. And Potomac Park is perfect. So they developed it. You know, they had a developing, a developer's eye. We'll put in a reflecting pool. It'll face the, the Washington Monument. It'll also face the White House on another axis. And by the way, it was a swamp. They had a lot of problems. The, the well, steps it's cracked. It's very interesting how you, how you, the base, you show some pictures of the base. Fabulous, fan, fantastical. I never knew what was below. Well. I will tell you, um, as a sidelight, that uh, the, the basement, also called the Undercroft, is being developed now as a visitor space. About time. And it's going to have a, ready for this, a bookstore. The Lincoln Memorial has never had a bookstore. Um, Commerce. Restrooms. I don't know how I And about you'll get to see the graffiti that workers put in there. Mm -hmm. And it's like a cave. If you go there in when it's 95 degrees in Washington, it's 69 degrees down there. If you go there when it's 30 degrees in Washington, it's 69 degrees in that basement. And no leakage from the Potomac? Oh, uh, I mean, a little. <laughs> OK. It's, the ground is mushy. There's no cement floor. It's what we used to call in the suburbs of New York an unfinished basement. And worker graffiti, it is an extraordinary. So David Rubenstein, the great philanthropist of history in Washington, who personally got the Washington Monument restored after the earthquake. No government money. That's how generous he is. He lent the Emancipation Proclamation that President Obama had in the Oval Office all those years. He is developing and financing the creation of the Undercroft. So it's going to be a great moment. Um, Did I mention it would have a bookstore? I guess so. <laughs> Do you have an inn? Abraham Lincoln Bookshop East? Well, we hope this, you know, uh, we'll see right. what happens. That's right. Yeah. Um, let's talk about, we just showed it, uh, Bjorn, the, the reflecting pool and the memorial in the background. And boy, if there's ever a symbol in Washington, that is it. Martin Luther King, Marian Anderson, Harry Truman, Richard Nixon, Bill Malden, Jim Stewart. Uh, tell us how it became such a powerful symbol, uh, American ideas and a magnet for major American rallies. 
and what is their connection to the house in which you work right now? Ah, thank you. Roosevelt House, Roosevelt. whose name you think is too long. I haven't forgotten that you said that. The, the, and I start with this in the book. The dedication of the Lincoln Memorial was a national disgrace. African Americans who had come early to get good seats were rousted out of their seats by mounted policemen using the N-word to get them out. They were put at the back on benches that had no backs. Other people just left. They were so offended. The only African American speaker was told he had to take all the comments out of his speech that criticized American progress on race since the, um, the death of Lincoln. So it was, for 17 years, the Lincoln Memorial was a symbol only of sectional reconciliation, not racial reconciliation, and not a place to dis discuss and dialogue about aspiration for to complete Lincoln's unfinished work. It was as if, we've done it all. Look at this statue. That shows that America is perfect. So in 1939, the great opera singer Marian Anderson, the first African-American woman to sing at the Metropolitan Opera, had a gig at the Daughters of the American Revolution. Apparently, someone signed her on not realizing she was a woman of color. They said, you can't sing here. So Eleanor Roosevelt, who lived in the place where I work, it was her home before the presidency, and Franklin's, and Franklin's mother, quite a group. Um, Eleanor arranged for Marian Anderson to sing on Easter Sunday, 1939, from the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. Um, 75,000 people stood in the rain. Millions more listened on radio to hear her sing, My Country Tis of Thee, Sweet Land of Liberty, of Thee We Sing not of the icing, she changed the lyrics. She sang, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. She sang an aria, millions listening on radio. And from that moment forward, the image of the Lincoln Memorial was transformed so much for the better. And it's been 80 years now since that concert, uh, at least in a couple of weeks, it'll be the 80th anniversary. And by the way, I recommend that people go on YouTube. If you want to hear the voice, a uh, magnificent voice, just, Marian Anderson at the Lincoln Memorial, and you'll get some of the concert. It's scratchy. It's from the radio, but it's you know chilling. Yeah. Um, and you know, and you mentioned Jimmy Stewart. Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Came out later that year, and where does Jimmy Stewart go as Mr. Smith to become inspired? He goes to the Lincoln Memorial. He hears a little boy reciting the words of the Gettysburg Address. He sees a, an African American looking at the statue with tears streaming down his eyes. How things have changed. They told Capra, you've got to cut that scene because you can't distribute it in the South if you have a black man in the scene. And, and Capra, who was then a liberal, was not a liberal later, but he said yes. He, I said no, I'm sorry, he would not cut the scene. So it survives. By the way, the same year, um, Abe Lincoln in Illinois comes out. And the fade out of that scene as Henry Fonda goes marching uh, toward his destiny, or riding on a mule or something toward his destiny, is a thunderstorm. And then you cut to the Battle Hymn of the Republic. And what do you see? The Lincoln Memorial. So 1939 is the it year. 80 years ago, it becomes something else. Uh, I'm just going to quickly mention Bill Malden. It's an interesting story how he made that cartoon after Kennedy's uh, death, where he had Lincoln with his face in his hands, but the hair looked very Kennedy-esque. Uh, and he did that, he had to do that in one, in a few hours. Of course. He had no time. And, uh, th and that's how that worked. So you think it was, it owed a debt to Kennedy's hair? You know, I think, um, yes, I do. Okay. I think that unconsciously, it's a great he did that. It's a great cartoon. Uh, Steve Schaefer in Madison, Georgia. We can't get to everyone, I'm sorry. So many of you, we thank you for your questions. We can't get to everyone, so I may get to one or maybe a little bit more of another, and that's about it, I'm sorry. Steve Schaefer from Madison, Georgia asks, is there a sculpture by French that in your opinion just fell flat then and or now? Well, the Republic was not a great work. It was too big. Uh, Two arms raised, is, two is not better than one. It's compared to the Statue of Liberty, which is so Was Lorado Taft saying that at the time, too? Uh, critics were saying it, that it's too, it was too archaic. Uh, it was based on you know, Greek statuary. Um, I think that one falls flat. 
I'm trying to think of what else. I, I, I don't love some of the equestrian portraits. But then again, as you said about Potter, French didn't do the horses either. He felt he wasn't a great equestrian sculptor, so he had a collaborator who did the horses, mm -hmm. and they just sat the, his statues on the horses. I think that's genius, not to do what you're not good at. Yeah, and find someone who is. Um, I have you here. I have a few topics I'd like to talk uh, briefly about because I have you here. Not about French. Um, OK. Uh, as long as the book is still showing. The book the is still showing. Everyone knows what this is about. Don't worry about that. And you can still get a signed copy, first edition. And I think this is going to be an important book. It is an important book. And reviews have been wonderful. Congratulations. You and your first edition comments. Yeah, you, that's you know right. You're famous. I know my famous. We should. You should just tell people that that's the best story. And well, this is how long ago? Ninety four four. Thirty five years ago, we were in the old Abraham Lincoln bookshop, and Mark Neely, Gabor Bord, and I were signing our first, I, my first book, the Lincoln Image. I think Mark had written the Abraham Lincoln Encyclopedia. Yes. Gabor had written Lincoln and the Economics. And the three of you were in for a signing. We were in for a signing, and. Uh, lovely lady came in and said to you, are you sure this is a first edition? And you said, no, the rare thing with them is when it's a second edition. That's right. <laughs> first editions aren't scarce. I tell that story. Second editions are scarce. Well, for me, that's what you Not were so saying. Much. No. Is, I tell that story on myself all the time. <laughs> now, so, why uh, did I mention that? Um, I oh, first edition. Right. right, exactly. So let's talk a moment about, and I think uh, uh, Jim Johnson here from Chicago was alluding to this question as well. And speak about the removal mm -hmm. of the Confederate statuary from public places. And people are always asking me, uh, what would Lincoln say about this or that? On page 173, you write that Robert Lincoln, uh, Robert E. Lincoln, Robert E. Lee, uh, quote, opposed commemorations that prolonged hard feelings. So, what do you think Lee would have said about the statuary and the removal now? Well, Lee was opposed to memorialization, and there was, uh, there were, but he also was opposed to northern memorialization, and there were lots of northerners and southerners who opposed even paintings. The great uh, panoramas in Harrisburg, at the Harrisburg State House, were condemned by people for showing the bloody, the angle, you know, the the end, the end of the, the of Pickett's Charge. So there, there, there always was a body of thought, but you can't stop. Heroic sculpture. It's been part of us since the Greeks and Romans. And um, so, well, what is your feeling on this? I have a feeling that I, you know, it's been mentioned that leave them in place mm -hmm. and put historical markers that give context mm -hmm. so that people can come through and understand why it was there and maybe why it shouldn't be there, but it is, and it's that. Personally, I don't especially mind the removal if they're used in another manner. I would love to see a large outdoor monument park where all of them are, and people could go to them and see them almost all at well, once is, is, and know what I it mean, is. I mean, I don't disagree. So Hungary, Hungary has done that. Budapest Have has a statue of villain, uh, park of villains, hmm. forgotten, and it's known to be that, but it's significant works of art. Hmm. So you go there and you see the Hungarians who were Nazi sympathizers during World War II, the communists who were repressive, um, which is a brilliant solution. Do we have the space for it? Do we have one place? I mean, they're in Richmond, they were in New Orleans, they're in Annapolis. The Confederate statues are everywhere. Yeah. There's no central, there's no Grand Central Depot uh, for, for Confederate statues. So my position, which as of last November. So in November, uh, what century are we in? 2018, yes. I gave a talk at the Gettysburg National Cemetery on the anniversary of the Gettysburg Address. And my Gettysburg Address was about Confederate statues. And my position at the time was like yours. Contextualize or build other statues. Um, in Richmond, they made a lame effort to uh, remediate the fact that there was Lee, Jeb Stewart, Jefferson Davis. Lee is a great statue. Jefferson Davis is an awful statue. But at the end of that district, they did Arthur Ashe. You would have thought they were putting Stalin in there. There was a huge fight in Richmond. And um, they put Ashe in. The problem with the Arthur Ashe is that he's a young guy in shorts carrying a tennis racket. So it's not a great work of art. So what do you do? Um, I still say build other statues. 
build Frederick Douglass in Richmond, do Robert Smalls, do um, Hiram Revels, the first African-American senator f serving in Jefferson Davis's seat. All that said, I have to say, I think that this battle is probably not salvageable. I don't think, this, I don't, don't think these statues are going to survive, mm -hmm. not just because Elizabeth Warren has now come for, out for removing a thousand statues. I don't know who's going to pay for that, but it's a, it's a popular position. I think they genuinely hurt and offend too many people. Wow, and, totally. and some of the players who are lionized are horrendous. Nath, doing Nathan Bedford Forrest is like doing Goebbels. Yes, it is. And that's how I thought about it when I first saw these being removed. And I said, well, you know, they're still historical. And then I thought, as a Jew, if I was going around to see a, a statue of Goebbels, how would I feel? And that's when I said, yeah. But let me give you it. another comparable. Please. So in Rome, the Arch of Titus is one of the great works of antiquity. Oh, right. What it shows is the Romans carrying off a menorah, a sacred Jewish candelabrum, from the Holy Temple of Jerusalem. So it's a, a celebration of looting from the Jews. I don't think anybody could make a rational argument that it's so offensive that you have to remove it because of its value as one of the great early surviving monumental works. Maybe because so much time has been passed, mm -hmm. although in Judaism, the destruction of the temple is still the subject of mourning and fasting and, and weeping. Remembered at, at and remembered at weddings. Remembered and remembered everywhere at weddings yeah. and two fast days. So what do you do? It's very complex. It's complex. I just don't like iconoclasm. I mean, when the UNC kids pulled down a really terrible statue, a cookie cutter statue of a sentinel, I thought, I don't like when kids misbehave necessarily, but at least it's not a great work of art. If somebody was to pull down Lee, it would be upsetting to me because it's a great work of art. The new museum of the Confederacy in Richmond is not going to save it. And if you put it in a museum, it'll be at a different eye level. These sculptures were made to be seen on high, which means they were, car and French was a master at this. You carve things very deeply because you know what the perspective is. If you bring them down to earth, they look like cartoons. So putting them in a museum is not an answer. Um, I'd hate to lose them. The, the, I mean, the Taliban said, let's get rid of the bombing exactly on Buddhas it. because they offend exactly us. It. And so there's a, now they're rebuilding them, copies of them, so yeah. they could become a tourist attraction. Yeah. So we, we reap what we sow. I want to uh, talk briefly again um, now about Lincoln. And one of the ubiquitous works in 1866 was Holland's Abraham Lincoln. I have a copy of it here. And um, I once had Ward Lamon's own copy. Wow. And he signed the, uh, the title page. Ward was, uh, of course, a political and legal colleague of Lincoln and a protector of Lincoln. Protector. And uh, it, maybe if he had been there uh, at the end, but he'd been sent off to Richmond he by Lincoln. He could have saved him. He said that, but who knows. Mm -hmm. um, but in this, Ward Lamon wrote in the, uh, in the, at the sides of the, of the pages and the margins. In one place, he said, where Holland talked about honesty, he uh, underlined it. And then in the margin, he said, honesty, he said, Lincoln could stretch the truth when necessary. <laughs> and another place where Holland said he loved everyone. And Lamon said, he loved no one but was kind to all. So you know, as an historian, you, I, I don't know, I certainly try to find flaws in the man. Otherwise, I'm the high priest for, right. for an idol, and right. I don't want that. I want it to be a human. To me, he's even more impressive as a human being. So what have you learned about Lincoln's weaknesses or flaws that we might tell people, yeah, he was a human, he had this? Well, he wasn't perfect, but if you, I mean, look, um, uh, he was uh, uh, an absentee father for his first son. And um, their distance hurt Robert, I think, in his development. He could have been a more important leader, I think. Maybe the DNA wasn't there. Maybe he was more like his mother than his father. Um, he was a, uh, a, a very uh, partisan politician in his early days, uh, when he could have been kinder then. But look, how do you? I, his friends thought he didn't really remember them more use them. Like I think he, yes. Um, there are great stories about 
um, his president elected when people are having secret meetings and saying, we made him and we can break him. He's forgetting all of his obligations. He's forgetting who made him what he is. Lincoln, and, I'll give that, and along those lines, Lincoln was very good at dropping the people that he knew and when he moved on. All of his friends in New Salem, who he allegedly doted on, and once he moved to Springfield, he had no use for them. You know, don't come and see me. Mentor Graham, no. you'll be in the books, but don't come and see me. When he gets to Washington, he doesn't want the Illinois people to follow him there. He doesn't appoint any of them. Um, Lamon he takes, but that's an exception. So he has every right to comment, even though we doubt his books today, but that's a whole other story. Um, sure, he had flaws, but look, Lincoln was president of the United States in a day when character was really crucial. He had, and when, and when Americans cared that their leaders had integrity. He's still a model for integrity and character and honesty and purpose and suffering and doing such hard work. I mean, he worked so hard and killed himself. He would have killed himself if he hadn't been killed. I, I certainly agree wholeheartedly because I think of the tricentennial, which we're not going to see. But uh, how is he going to be? I, I, uh, <laughs> you and I both. But uh, is he going to, you know, I, I know he'll be remembered for certain things, but it's going to get a little bit colder, I think. Ending slavery, that was a nice thing, a good thing he did that, uh, or helped. Uh, kept the United States together, a very good thing as well. Personally, I think it is exactly what you're saying, his character that's going to be remembered and be most useful to people today and onward, past the tricentennial. And I hope that people keep reading, because no president has ever written as brilliantly as Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. His words are equal to the founding documents. I mean, the Declaration and the Gettysburg Address and the Second Inaugural belong in the same page. Well, I don't know what happens reputationally. I don't know who we get in the next cycle of presidents. But um, one of our friends and another author, Brian Lamb, and his longtime collaborator, Susan Swain, who recently celebrated their 40th anniversary together. Not professionally. As professionally, because C-SPAN just turned 40 yep. last weekend, as we sit here. This is based a little bit on it. Brian, right. thank you for everything you've done to mentor me uh, through the television. And what have you done for me lately? That's my second part. Right? Yeah. But That's him. Right, that's him. That's not Dan. Um, they have a new book coming out. Um, it's coming out in, in uh, April. A base, so it's their historical rankings of presidents. Oh. And they're going to base it... Um, uh, and they're going to they're do transcripts of interviews with historians on particular presidents, mm -hmm. but arranged from one, two, three. So I get to be the first person in the book because I, I happen to talk about Lincoln, mm -hmm. not because of me. So Lincoln is one, um, Washington is two, and Franklin Roosevelt is three. Um, and that's a new appraisal. So it's nice that historians are still ranking. The public, I think they're ranking based on media at this point. So... Ronald Reagan is sometimes at the top because he had a brilliant um, approach to television. He was a warm and real personality. Kennedy is higher than maybe he should be in terms of accomplishment because he was charismatic and he's on newsreels. Yeah, I think if you're in black and white photographs, it's hard to just, sustain. Just like Garfield was really a very Kennedy-esque person yes. in his day. And today, uh, okay, another assassinated president. Right. But and I think Kennedy, that, yeah. he was reverting the time, as is Kennedy still today, for those of us who were in Camelot. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's going, the emotions are going to die out, and I think Kennedy is not going to be what he is today to many of us. I think, reputationally, Lincoln will hold his place. I think so, too. Um, the writing were, alone, as you say, is very Again, rich. he wasn't perfect. Was he racist? I don't know. Compared to us, he's racist. Compared to... Uh, you know, but he learned. But he did learn. But still, he's not where we would like a 21st century man to be. Well, he, wasn't, people, he was a 19th. Century. He was a 19th century man. So that's going to that that taints the reputation a little because people apply inevitably they apply modern judgments. But he survives it. I think he survives it well. Well, look, the Monument Men. This is what you're here for, and uh, really a fun and interesting book. And you're going to find oodles of little stories that you didn't know about. A really a great man, Daniel Chester French, who himself uh, went to great men and had to place them in front of all of us 
for eternity if they're in bronze or maybe in marble. So uh, we thank Princeton Architectural Press for helping you come here. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a monument man, the life and art of Daniel Chester French. And I think you're going to enjoy $35. You can order it now. If you're on YouTube watching this afterward, uh, we're probably going to still have, as long as they last, uh, we'll have, because we have a crowd out here who is going to buy as well. So get to us quickly, and you've got a first edition signed from uh, Mr. Holzer. So again, we thank you very much for being here. And I thank the staff of Author's Voice, House Divided. Our show, we'll be doing this again very soon. You can watch, go to authorsvoice.net and you'll find the shows coming up uh, on House Divided or Stranger Than Fiction, which is our nonfiction show that's other than our specialty here in the shop. If you're here in the Chicago area during one of these or even not, we have an open shop at Abraham Lincoln Bookshop. Please feel free to come on in and enjoy our museum because that's really what you're going to see. So again, Thank you for being with us. We'll see you again shortly.